it's, it's not a huge crowd, but they're enthusiastic. <laughs> and that's good. Hi, I'm Robert McBride of All Classical Portland. Just arrived from Dublin last night, and my arms are really tired. You know, the joke, you flew in from Dublin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is Carlos Calmar, music director of the Oregon Symphony. Hi, good evening. Carlos has much more experience with jet lag than I do. Colin Curry, our soloist tonight, no doubt has. But Colin is a child compared to us. Compared to us. He's a mere 40 years uh, old. Ugh. He's looking good for 40, too, and uh, yeah. doing really well. Now, otherwise, we have a lot of 30-something action tonight. Ein Helden Leben by Richard Strauss was written when he was in his mid-30s. A Hero's Life, he puts this thing forth when he's only in his mid-30s. He, uh, yeah, he, he, he had a certain attitude. And we have a percussion concerto written by a 30-something composer. And then the first piece on the program was written by a 67-year-old composer now. And I'm not going to divulge my age or yours. They're it's kind of it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. Go on Wikipedia and figure it out. That's, That's true. What I would say. It's easy. There's <laughs> just no place to hide anymore. <laughs> There's nothing private. Whatever yeah. you say will bite you in 20 years. Yeah, or, or much sooner. Because I was out of the country for a bit, I didn't host Thursdays at 3 this week when Colin was there and performed live at All Classical Portland. And I'm sorry I missed that because I really like the guy. Oh, the guy is, is wonderful. And uh, so Colin Curry is our artist in residence uh, at the Oregon Symphony, the second one we choose. It's always a tenure of three years. And Colin is right now in the middle. And uh, you know, when you choose an artist in residence, you are very, very careful that it's somebody who actually is approachable, likes to go out in the community because Essentially, it's a lot of community work, and yes, on the side, he can play solo with the Oregon Symphony. Uh, so, and Colin is absolutely an astounding artist in residence uh, who, who really enjoys uh, working with people, meeting people, very much working with uh, the younger crowd or performing in front of the younger crowd today. I had uh, the pleasure of uh, conducting a part of the rehearsal of MYS, Metropolitan Youth Symphony. And uh, I mean, that organization is, is astounding what happens on Saturdays with that organization because they take charge of a school and pretty much in every room there is a different ensemble. It's, it blows your mind. And of course, I have the pleasure of working with the kids who play in the highest level orchestra and they, in three weeks they are going to have a concert and blah, blah, blah. But then there is the jazz group, there is the little group, there is that thing, and then the percussion goes with Colin Curry uh, and Michael, who is one of our um, percussionists here. And they all had such a great time and Colin is really so generous with these things. and. Uh, we as the Oregon Symphony, we took Colin as our artist in residence with the hope uh, that he would be that type of personality, which he definitely is. And then, of course, we got into this issue that three years in a row he's going to be our soloist. So what the hell are we going to play with him? <laughs> because uh, the art form of percussion concerts, uh, co concert for percussion and orchestra, is a fa fairly young art form. Um, it started actually in the 20th century someplace and now more and more concerts are being written and um, the piece that you're going to hear tonight is a very young piece, uh, not only by a young composer but the, the, the piece doesn't exist for such a long time uh, and it was written for Colin and next time when Colin comes back to Oregon he's going to world premiere a piece that we commissioned for him and us by a very young, I think even younger than 35, Andy Akiho uh, out in the East Coast is going to write a piece for Colin and we are all very keen. And the thing with 
percussion concertos that uh, is always very interested is um, at some point the visual aspect of it. Uh, now, if you remember, and if you have been here last year when Colin played his first concert as artist in residence, that was kind of an amazing piece, the Veni Veni Emanuel by James Macmillan. That was in such a way an untypical percussion concerto because it was kind of restrained. He didn't run around like a maniac on the stage to get from one instrument to the other. And, and the piece itself uh, was also extremely meaningful in the sense of James Macmillan writes music where I would say at least 80% of what he writes is religiously infused because he's a very uh, devout, deep thought Scottish composer. And now what you have tonight is an animal of a very different breed. Very and, and that's the fun of it, because at first sight, is this is more in the corner of let's run around uh, <laughs> concerto. But it has actually a couple of ideas that I find absolutely magical. What this young man, Andrew Norman, American composer, what he actually cooks up. Because when you call a concerto switch and you actually you mean the word switch literally meaning think of switch of light it's on or it's off and you take this idea into music then something very fascinating comes out of this so just to give you a little bit of an idea what you're going to hear is you're going to hear maybe 10 seconds of quiet music with a very important motive in a vibraphone. And the vibraphone is not played by Colin. By the way, don't get afraid if the soloist is not on stage when we start the concert. He's here. He, he will be playing. Uh, and after that, music starts that is absolutely manic. It's so fast. It's so, uh, Colin himself, and you can read that in the, in the program notes that we have said, it's like being pra trapped in a room where it's a pinball, the tong, 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 that bounces off. Yes, I felt reminded since w the two of us have uh, already hinted that uh, we are not in our 40s. Uh, I feel reminded of when I ever watch this uh, in MTV, the, the videos of uh, pop musicians, and the cuts are very fast. I think like, wait, can you just stay for at least seven seconds with one take? And no, it's like take, 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 and I'm, yeah. In a way, that's a little bit the idea. On top of that, <laughs> the idea of switch is that so, I mean, you would have to go up and see the stage from above uh, before we start the concert. Because, yes, you see, this is kind of what you expect in a percussion concert. But um, this is a concert for a soloist, a large orchestra, and in the large orchestra there are three additional percussionists. One there, one in the middle, and one there. Now, these percussionists, mostly Colin, but all of them, have the, the, what they trigger in the orchestra is different sounds, different patterns, different motives. So that's how the piece bounces. And there are, um, there are parts in this score when it gets a little less frantic and where it's so apparent what actually switch does musically, because I can tell you it's like switching something on and switching something off. But it is, if I can tell you this with language, it is, a f for example, if a click starts a sentence, if I tell you, what can I tell you? This is a great piece of music that I 
like to conduct. You, you hear that actually this is a switch. So every time there is a click, it either starts or it stops. There is a part when, when the, 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 the strings play this and then the woodwinds play very long notes, melodies, and it's all switched on, off, on, off. Fascinating. There is also in this piece the, the element of theatrics, a tiny bit. That's why Colin is not on stage. Uh, at the beginning, um, and on top of that, when you think about switch, switching on and off, sometimes he writes this wonderful word for the strings, freeze. So they play, and then they, and then they continue playing. So there is this visual element, and it's so much fun. Um, and I think to add to this quality of music, uh, uh, Colin and I have been talking about this since the first rehearsal. The piece works because mainly the ending of the piece. Because if you once think about something that is very frantic and that works sometimes you can say in formulas and gets your attention at 150% and with the speed of light, you can only sustain this idea for that long because you wear actually the attention of everybody out after a while. And that is why there are already some stoppages within the concerto, not much, but very important. And then the entire piece at the end kind of dissolves itself, kind of it's like, It gets quieter and quieter until there is only one note, and then the piece is over. But we, Andrew, Colin, I, I'm sure many musicians of the Oregon Symphony who really do such a fantastic job with this, we agree that this piece wouldn't work if it would be only the fast-paced music, and because you would at the end feel like you need to, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, it's, it's many things at the same time, and I think this is actually uh, definitely a percussion concert that we will hear for quite a long time. In fact, this performance and tomorrow nights, or tomorrow afternoons, rather, and Monday nights are all being recorded, which is why all these microphones are all around the place, for a future compact disc release by the Oregon Symphony and this guy. Carlos Calmer. You mentioned the program notes. I hope you will take the time to read your program notes tonight. They're really good for all three pieces on the program. It's ironic that I was traveling in Scotland. You had this Scottish percussionist here. And we heard a new concerto played by the Scottish Chamber Orchestra, which they commissioned. Piano concerto by a 30-something Scottish composer named Martin Suckling. I was traveling with a group of people, about 30 people, all classical fans. And we got into some really interesting conversations after that concert about that piece. Because some people in the group liked it, other people just didn't know what to make of it at all. And they had some interesting things to say. Like one said, I don't know how to listen to music like that. And another said, well, it's kind of like attending a lecture on a subject you don't fully understand, but still you come away being enriched by the experience. And one guy in the group said that modern music that's kind of incomprehensible on first hearing always sounds to him like it's notated with question marks, <laughs> which I thought was really brilliant. I loved that concerto. Maybe I'll get to hear it again someday, maybe not. Interesting, because when I was a student, uh, in, in the University of Vienna. I remember that I attended a class which was not, it was a voluntary class, it was not something you had to do, uh, but I heard this so interesting and I literally had what you described for th nearly nine months. This experience of I was sitting there fascinated about it and had no idea what the professor was talking about. <laughs> uh, 
But I knew it was great, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I figured it out. Probably by now I have forgotten it, but that's how life is. Was that the school that Bruckner taught at, or was that a different one? No, that's the, yeah, it was the school really? at which Bruckner taught at. You studied at the University of Anton Bruckner. Well, come on, when you live in Vienna, as wow. I did for 38 years, you did, simply don't get intimidated, because otherwise you don't, you, I, for three years, I was music director of an orchestra there, our main performance, Hall was the golden hall, music for in Vienna. Well, I knew that I'm standing on the podium where Gustav Mahler, Johannes Brahms, Anton Bruckner conducted. And I thought, like, uh, brush it aside. <laughs> Speaking of Johann Strauss, not Johann Strauss, Richard Strauss, Ein Heldenleben is such a cheeky piece of music. I, a hero's life. So this guy's only 35, and he writes this big piece that depicts the hero's exploits in life and his creations and the criticism of the critics nagging away when he depicts them in a, in a really funny way. And so it's engendered all this talk about, well, is Strauss really depicting himself here, or is he offering us something that's more general about, about a brave person's creative life and going up against whatever ob obstacles it may present. What do you think? Is it Strauss uh, giving us the biggest portrait of human ego ever or not? Uh, you know, I think that uh, some of it, yes, he's, he's kind of like looking himself in the mirror and saying, well done, Richard. But of course, there are limitations to um, us interpreters and how we perceive, let's say, the human side of a composer. But at the end of the day, so many years after the composer's death, and so many years after you literally know that this composer is a genius, I personally. I don't care at all because you know what? If if I and many many others would really care, then no way we could play the music of Richard Wagner. Because sorry, not not a nice fellow, and so anti-Semitic, and we couldn't. And that's why Wagner still in Israel is a, a real problem for a reason, and I, th I think that deserves respect. And th th but yeah, sure. The Heldenleben is, uh, by Richard Strauss, is a little bit of, yes, he pats himself on the shoulder, but he needed to do that, probably. I think that is a strike of genius, what he does, because you look at the piece, and the piece is so colorful, so energetic, so amazing. And then comes the battle of the hero with his adversaries. And until the battle ends, and there is kind of the hero uh, remains triumphant, you actually don't really know that he might mean himself. It's just a piece of music, of really good music. And then comes this little segment, uh, the good works of the hero. And that is where the key to the piece is in the terms of being a, an egocentric piece. Because what does he put there? His own music. <laughs> so in terms of the good works of the hero speak for him, you hear Till Eulenspiegel, Death and Transfiguration, all the works that he wrote, uh, Don Juan, etc., 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 all of them compiled within a brief section. And of course, you think, like, yeah, I know it's good pieces. Can you stop talking about it? And after having done this piece uh, many times, I simply yeah, I know it's there, but I love it so much. And uh, the, the thing with Strauss that always fascinates me, it, and with this piece, maybe even more than with anything else, 
because we are not talking about opera, different animal, is how great it sounds. It's just, uh, this is the master of instrumentation of the 20th century, and we have a lot of them that instrumentate really well. But I remember um, when I was, I haven't done this piece for quite a while, but there is, before he's, he, he wrote all these famous pieces, he wrote a symphony, 45 minutes uh, of music called Aus Italien from Italy. And it's kind of cheesy and, uh, yeah, uh, hmm. But you are there as a conductor and you give the upbeat and it sounds, it just sounds so, ma it's magic what happens. And as a conductor, and I say this with the true admiration and love that I have for Richard Strauss, one of the greatest geniuses. You look at the Alpine Symphony, one of his great works, and you think, substance-wise, not the greatest piece on earth, but sound-wise, hard. It's impossible to beat that guy. Just the beginning of a hero's life, this voluptuous, energetic richness. Do you feel like a hero conducting that stuff? N no. <laughs> How about a god? No, it's just a, you know, you know what happens, I think, when you, uh, when you conduct, uh, to me, is you just, you just feel very uh, positive when you're standing in front of an orchestra like this, who I, I had the honor of being the music director for over 13 years, and this, they play, and it's like, more cake. <laughs> More frosting. So this makes you want to hear all of this, doesn't it? It makes me want to hear it. Yeah, yeah. So in, in the remaining time we have, we should say a little bit about the first piece on the program, which I haven't heard, but which I gather is rather soft, uncharacteristically so, for its composer, which sounds like a nice way to set up this very energetic percussion concerto. I think that is, uh, in, a, in a way, this concert, the program that you are hearing tonight is absolutely amazing. Uh, and it is amazing because, of course, each segment, but because of the Rouse piece, uh, Christopher Rouse, a composer that we have played here, uh, usually high energy, loves percussion, goes after it with, loves rock music. So that's how Christopher Rouse is in many of his pieces. He even wrote one honoring John Bonham, the drummer in Led Zeppelin. Yeah, I mean, it's like Bleh! And then he writes this piece called Supplica, like su supplication, begging for something. Um, and it is absolutely in a different corner of the universe. It's slow, it's quiet, and has a very intense character within its quietness. And the great thing about this piece is that nobody can really tell you what he meant. Because, yeah, you'll see the title, Supplica, and you think, oh, is it a piece of religious music? Is it a piece so he remembers a friend that he cared for something? And he simply did not give a hint. But it's very clear, I would say, that this is a piece that is um, as short as it is, it's very meaningful for the composer. It's something like, I give you a glimpse at my intimate self. So just take it. I'm not going to tell you which part of myself it is, but this is it. And it's also, in, if you look at the entire concert, uh, you have the Richard Strauss piece, which is, as I said, voluptuous pieces of cake with an enormous amount of frosting. <laughs> and you play all the stops of an orchestra in this kind of late romantic tradition. You have the Andrew Norman, which is so fast and so fascinating 
and rich in a very different way that if you would start the concert with something that is also like raw, at the end of the concert you would be like, oh, I can't take it anymore. But that's why Suplica works so well, because it's kind of a quiet setup. And because Robert said it, uh, that you have to look or you see all the mics, I, I'm sure that the president of the Oregon Symphony, when he comes out to speak to you, will remind you. This is not only a concert that we record um, for our friends at 89.9 All Classical. The first piece is the start of our new CD. We are, we are um, starting a new CD that will have a lot of American music. Most of it never recorded. Yay. Yay. That's yeah. what I say. But it, it does mean we must be very quiet. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's a quiet piece. Because the microphones will pick up everything. Yeah. If you want to go for eternity, cough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So with that, I think we'll give you a chance to read your program notes, maybe, be, maybe chat among yourselves and meet a new friend. And get ready for another oral assault from the Oregon <laughs> Symphony and Carlos Calmer. Robert McBride. I'm gonna stay out here and chat with people.